a pleasure to have with me my friend Brett Baer, head muckety muck of news over there at Fox. How are you, Brett? Hey, Mark. How are you? Well, let me say this to you. I really mean this. Sometimes I'm critical of our own. Fox has, far and above all other news organizations, done a tremendous job bringing the truth and the facts of what's taken place in Israel to the American people. And the news department, you and Martha in particular, and Trey, have really been second to none. And I imagine when you watch these things, it turns your stomach. It's probably hard to sleep at night. That's what I'm finding. Yeah. These video images put out mostly by Hamas. And the acts and the atrocities. I mean, how do you deal with this? Yeah, Mark, it's true. And, um, you know, I did two hours with Dana this morning. And uh, then did my show, but seeing it real time, and a lot of this stuff comes in as you're anchoring uh, and digesting actual reports where uh, reporters are on the ground talking to commanders about finding a kibbutz with babies, you know, 40 babies killed, uh, some of them beheaded. That's not fake stuff. I mean, we confirm it on the ground. We and and the the videos and the wrenching testimonials of of family members who have missing people who are believed to be held hostage in Gaza, um, it is tough and it takes a toll. It's visceral, and so I think you have to express that and you have to take a deep breath and be able to cover it in a fair way, but also face the horribleness. The it's not really a word, but the depravity of it so that people understand what we're watching and we're watching something that as you've said before is nazis you know exponentially it is it is the second holocaust and i've read your stuff and i think you're right on after having anchored hours at a time and yet there are elements in our country in our college campuses honestly within the democrat party who see the same thing we're seeing and go from non-committal in terms of outrage to blaming Israel to calling for the obliteration of Jews in our own country. I mean, I don't remember that yeah. during the Holocaust, or at least reading about it during the Holocaust. This is pretty shocking how many people, particularly young people in this country, are of this mindset, is it not? It is, and that's why I think it's so important to tell those stories from the ground. I mean, this is not military on military. This is not just tit for tat. This is not the long battles that we've seen back and forth. This is civilians, families, kids, babies. Um, that's a different level. And so we have a duty to show it. And, you know, maybe some of those people have a, a change of mind after they see it. One more question, because I want to get to your fantastic book, too. The administration says that they all support Israel, come hell or high water. Yet an assistant national security advisor, several hours back, talked about proportionality. The response needs to be proportionate. My wife says to me, what, the Israelis have to rape and maim and decapitate? That's proportionate. In other words, this is absurd. Why don't we let the Israelis do what they have to do? They're a humane people. They have a democratic government. They're facing annihilation. I don't remember people telling us what to do after 9-11. We were in Afghanistan for 21 years. This is problematic as far as I'm concerned. You either, you're either going to have to defeat an enemy or you're not going to defeat an enemy. And you're going to have your soldiers go door to door to door, get whacked one after another. That's a tiny country. And then there's Hezbollah sitting there. There's Syria sitting there. Of course, the big one, Iran is sitting there. Do we really expect? Israel to fight this with hands tied behind its back? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think this is going to be the challenge because what's going to happen is Israel is going to do what it sees fit. And that includes annihilating and eliminating Hamas, which is going to be a very ugly public process. Uh, and letting Israel do that without weighing in or 
somehow hindering it anyway, uh, I think is going to be the challenge not only for the U.S. administration, shouldn't be, but it will be, and also for countries in the region. Uh, so the next, I would say, week, but listen, to be honest, this is going to be weeks on weeks. I had the Israeli ambassador to the U.N. on tonight, and uh, he was very blunt and said they're going to do what they have to do. Uh, but it's going to take a long time. I also want to thank you for your outstanding interview with Kirby. I mean, he kept wiggling, and you wouldn't you wouldn't let him out of the box there, and you kept saying, so, wait a minute, that's not what I'm saying. Yes, we know that, but that's not what I'm saying. That's the kind of reporting I think the American people need. I want to get to your book, because it actually relates, and I think Americans can identify with this. It is a fantastic book. You sent me an early copy. I read it. I'm sort of a... Uh, Self-made historian in many ways, a constitutionalist. To rescue the Constitution, George Washington and the Fragile American Experiment. Well, let me ask you. George Washington faced a hell of a lot of challenges. What kind of general was he? You know, he answered the call every time. He was a reluctant uh, leader. He answered the call as a military man. Um, He would go on to be the commander of the Continental Army. Uh, He led them, uh, which was a tough (laughs) group. The soldiers, he called when he first saw them, exceedingly dirty and nasty. However, he he inspired them and fought beside them them and and inspired leadership. He built them up, kept them going, and convinced they could win, convinced them they could win. Um, He went on after the victory. Uh, to be called up again. All he only wanted to do was go home to Mount Vernon and be with his wife, Martha. Uh, but he was called up again because the country was falling apart and the colonies were battling each other. It's actually one of the most divided and dangerous times of the era. The fractures are so great that a lot of the country feels like maybe we should go back to British rule. Uh, that's when the Constitutional Convention starts in Philadelphia, starts to rework the Articles of Confederation, and then they decide, you know what, that's not going to work. We've got to start over. And, and George Washington is the figure that holds it all together as an as a embodiment of what the document ends up being, the greatest legal document that provides liberty to any country. I want you to stay with us because we're going to have a break soon. But my question is this. Do you consider George Washington the greatest president or one of the greatest presidents, maybe one of the two greatest presidents in American history? And why? What was it about this man and his character and his capabilities? He was able to lead the army, win the revolution, lead the nation, and then retire and go home. What was it about this man? The book is To Rescue the Constitution, George Washington and the Fragile American Experiment. I encourage you to get it. We will link to it on all my social platforms so you can just grab it real fast. The Revolutionary War was a brutal, brutal war. Thousands of American colonists, militia and soldiers died on the prisoner ships parked outside of New York from dysentery, from eating rancid food. And God knows what else. In fact, almost half of the deaths that occurred during the Revolutionary War occurred in those prison boats. And as my friend Brett Baer writes, Washington had to fight through all this. He didn't have a lot of victories. He had a very small professional army compared to the militia he had. And he had to keep them together. He had to keep them in fighting order. He had to win key battles. And so my question to you, Brett Baer, is do you consider him, subsequent to all of this, helping keep the nation together, the greatest president in American history is certainly one of them? Definitely. I mean, listen, he was called to serve first president. Imagine what it's like for him. There is no model. No one left him a note in the desk telling him what to do. No one passed him the torch. I mean, he was the torch. So every aspect of the presidency really had to be invented a new and he would create this executive to what it is today but his biggest maybe most significant action was when he left after two terms there was no prescribed limit on how long a president could serve and and so he didn't declare himself indispensable and this was the peaceful transition of power you know right there's this uh, story after john adams 
is inaugurated, second president. They're heading out of the room, and Adams stands back to allow Washington to go first. And Washington turns to him and motions Adam forward and says, you're the president now. And, you know, everything I researched about this man suggests that he was the reason that the country stayed together. He was the reason that it was founded the way it was founded. These are not, you know, just stories made up. These are in diaries, in in little nuggets that we call them in the history books uh, and in, in the archives. And so, yes, I think he's definitely the best. Um, I, I look to others. Ulysses S. Grant kept us together and prevented mm-hmm. the Second Civil War. I think Reagan was a fantastic president and a communicator. I think mm-hmm. um, Dwight Eisenhower was overlooked as a president that history will look back at and say he kept us peaceful during the Cold War. And Washington had a hell of a cabinet. He had some really big egos there, didn't he? First of all, Adams is vice president. He has Jefferson in there and Hamilton who hate each other's guts. And in, adi- and in addition to all that, Jefferson was really aligned with the French. Hamilton really aligned with the British. They were going at war, that is, the French and the British. You write all this stuff. They're leaking to the media to try and sort of undermine each other. And Washington had to deal with all of this, right? It, was, it wasn't just smooth going as president of the United States. No, far from it. And he had troubles. He was not perfect, uh, made mistakes. He conceded. Uh, there was still a battle for dominance between federal power and states' rights. I mean, that's still a battle today. And, you know, Mark, in the big picture of, of this book about the Constitution, you know, there's a lot of people that question, it doesn't work today. Um, it was far from perfect. Uh, it, was, it wasn't. It uh, was But you look at that document and the process of constitutional amendments, 27 of them, first 10, obviously, Bill of Rights. But you, you look at, say, how would we do it today? And, yeah, you could make tweaks and changes. But for the most part, as you know more than anybody, the Constitution is the greatest legal document mm-hmm. ever written. Ever written. They borrowed from philosophers of the past. They saw what countries failed, what countries succeeded. And you know, Brett Baer, it's self-correcting. Now, not on a whim, not with a faction or a simple majority, but ultimately it's self-correcting, and it has been corrected. But it was also, you know, Brett Baer knows this. Folks, get his book. It is a tremendous book. I know these are very difficult times right now, but every now and then you got to take a little break to rescue the Constitution, George Washington, the fragile American experiment. Nobody supported the Constitution more in 1852 than Frederick Douglass, really the leading abolitionist and uh, escaped slave and so forth and so on. And he said to the Constitution, the Constitution doesn't promote slavery. We need virtuous people to execute what the Constitution says. That's kind of what you write in this book, too. The Constitution is not perfect. But the biggest problem is you have to have people who believe in it who are going to truly support their oath to it, their allegiance to it. And sometimes today we have people who say they do, but they really don't. But, but Washington was all those things, wasn't he? He was. And listen, I, I came to the end of this process, and, and you know, I've, this is the fifth in the presidential books. and, and Your you books are great. We're talking about them. And I'm trying to do it in a soda straw look at a moment in history and in a narrative way that's readable especially for younger generation, because I, I, we've talked about this before, Mark, but I really believe that young people are not getting our history of who we are as a country. Mm-hmm. So, but I have to say, at the end of this process, I, I, researching, writing it, it, it gave me a sense of hope, you know, not because mm-hmm. the birth of, of our nation was so smooth, but because it wasn't smooth. And the dissent is built in the cake. It's baked in. And so mm-hmm. is the union and trying to find a mix between dissent and union, and really that is what Washington taught us. And when you and your your folks do the research, and you write the book, and you edit the book, and you finish the book, because this Mm -hmm. happens with me too, and here you have this book, it's a fantastic book, ladies and gentlemen. You say to yourself sometimes, all right, this is really good. And sometimes you say, I wonder what the reader will think. So when you finish this book, 
What did you conclude? Listen, I've been through this process. The first one took three and a half years. I, yeah. And uh, each one since has been about a year and a half because I, I got the blueprint. I have a great team, researcher, co-author. We bounce back and forth. But at the end of this book, I was actually the most proud of this one. You know, I use the beginning and end to talk about current times and Mm -hmm. things that we're facing now. But I think if somebody reads this book, you just get a sense of who we are at the very, very beginning. And I just think that's important for the big pendulum that we face every day. Um, Mm -hmm. And listen, we fight these battles every day about what's right and wrong. Uh, But if we go back to our founding fathers, they had a pretty good sense of things. So when you saw, as a journalist, and I tell people journalists can be patriotic, you know. Uh, Not all are, but you certainly are. Um, When you saw monuments coming down, including the desecration of George Washington, Lincoln, and others, I guess what you felt was, my God, these people don't know history at all, do they? What what were you thinking? It's sad so sad you know i I saw that happen as i was writing my last book to rescue the republic about ulysses s grant and i actually start the book with a um, a frame of watching this television um report out of san francisco where a statue of ulysses s grant was being taken down um they said because he owned slaves you know he did more as a president for mm-hmm. blacks, the black community, for fighting um, slavery, for going after the KKK than arguably any president. Mm-hmm. And yet here he was being taken down. Um, George Washington, you know, removed from school names. And after you, you know, if you read this book of all that he did, they knew that the slavery issue was wrong. They just couldn't deal with it at the time. They were trying to start the country. But they knew, you know, inherently that here is a document providing liberty. So you were going to say that one man is three-fifths of a man. They knew there was a problem, but they wanted to get the country moving. And um, so I think our history can tell us a lot. And, and yeah, I felt sad when I saw those statues going down. By the way, no other and country. Angry, frankly. angry, yeah. No other countries fought a civil war and slavery. There's not another one on the face of the earth. And slavery still goes on in the world, in the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world, which nobody pays any attention to. Um, but I want to tell you something. I want something. to ask you this, one question, Mark. I yes, want to ask sir. you one question. At the yes, end sir. of the book, there is this uh, experiment with a progressive group, a conservative group, and a libertarian group. And mm-hmm. they say, okay, write a constitution. Yeah. And, and they basically come back with the same document. The libertarians say, you know, leave the document as it is, but then at the end put, we mean it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the progressives say the electoral college is a problem, we're going to make some tweaks, but for the most part, it's the same document. And the conservatives say there are some problems here. Executive power is not clearly defined, but it's the same document. You know, if we had a constitutional convention, and you've talked about this, what do you think would come out today? Mm -hmm. I don't think they could agree on where to meet right now, to be perfectly honest with you. That's a whole other story. (laughs) Brett, you're a good friend. You really are. People don't know we talk often enough. Yep. And uh, he tries to set me straight, you know. But anyway, no, he's good. The other way around. No, I'm just kidding. And um, I want to encourage you to rescue the Constitution, George Washington, and the fragile American experiment. I cannot recommend it strongly enough. It's on Amazon. It's discounted. It should be in every major bookstore. It just came out the other day. It's unfortunate it came out now, but there's no control over that. But you can still order it, still have it, still gift it during the holidays and so forth. And it is a refreshing, truly historical account, things I didn't know about the great George Washington. Great job, Brett Bear. God bless you, my friend. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. All right, you take care of yourself.